Just before we all went on lockdown, I had the privilege to talk to Chris Rose. Chris has been a hugely experienced and influential environmental campaigner. He was a leading figure in the iconic Shell Brent Spa campaign with Greenpeace. He now runs his own business, helping campaigns to be more effective. And he recently produced a detailed report assessing the new environmentalist movements around Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion. There are links to his website, to that report and to his social media in the video description. I encourage you to check all of those out. In this video, we talk about his journey through the campaigning groups, what he learned about what works and what doesn't. We talk about campaign effectiveness and we end up discussing some of his findings about those modern environmental movements. There are lots of ways to achieve change in the world, of course, but if you're interested in how these sorts of campaigns can best be successful, you won't find anyone out there more thoughtful and experienced on the subject than Chris Rose. So without further ado, let's just jump straight in. So Chris, welcome to the podcast. You have been a driving force behind some iconic environmental campaigns, including the Shell Brent Spa. You thought more about how to make campaigns effective than almost anyone I know. And you've recently done a very detailed review of Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion, that sort of modern environmental campaign strategy. We will talk about all of that in due course. But first, I'm interested to know how change makers get onto that path in the first place. And so how about if we start by going right the way back when the very young Chris Rose first left school and looked ahead to adult mm. life? What did the world look like to you then? <clears throat> well... I first got involved in trying to change things or realising that feeling you had to try and change something, actually probably while I still was at school, because um, I was really, and I still am, into birds. And, you know, I wanted to be like David Attenborough or something when I was a kid. Yeah. And um, that, I spent a lot of time uh, doing voluntary conservation work, nature conservation work. And it was seeing places and things disappear, like when they built a huge rubbish dump over the end of a nature reserve near where I lived, and when they wanted to dig up a place called Frey's Farm, which was in um, the Colm Valley, near where they're putting HS2, in fact, maybe through it for all I know. And uh, realising that the planning system didn't necessarily do what I assumed it would do, which is to protect somewhere just because it's recognised as important. And it was necessary to do something else. And that's when, you know, I first got involved in campaigning as a volunt through voluntary nature conservation. Yes. And then my interest in nature led me to do science like ecology although i was actually much better at english <laughs> at university yes. and then and this was in aberystwyth in aberystwyth yeah well i had a great time doing i loved doing plant ecology um and then i because i didn't know what else to do and um, i ended up trying to do research phd which never got written up and i ended up in um well, I, I got involved in doing more and more conservation lobbying, started a thing called BANC, British Association of Nature Conservationists, gave it a posh sounding title to make it because we thought it might be taken seriously, but it was just a ginger group. When, so so when was that in the, the timeline? That was, was when I, was after I, that, well, that's while I was doing an MSc in right. conservation at UCL. And then I went to Chelsea College and was doing research for a PhD. On so while you were studying ecology, ecology and, and uh, zoology and all of these things, did you have it in your mind that maybe you were heading into a scientific career? Or, or does Bank suggest that you always had it in mind that no, you were going to No, there came, like there came a quite distinct uh, moment when I was realize that I wasn't going to go into a scientific career um, which was when I got involved in campaigning about the sort of takeover of the then Nature Conservancy Council which was the government conservation agency which had been very powerful well it was small but influential yeah. and it was being stuffed under the Thatcher government with um, appointees of 
people like Nick Ridley, who are right-wing landowners lobby, and they were putting all these people from the NFU and the Country Landowners Association in charge. And we, me and my mates, students, thought this was terribly wrong, and we said so. And I was then informed by the guy actually running the Nature Conservancy administrator that I would never work for it, and yeah. that my... And and I remember people saying to me, because I was doing, then afterwards, actually, when I was doing research, you know, your career as a scientist is finished, this is a disaster. And I was thinking, well, actually, I think this is more interesting than doing, <laughs> being a research scientist. And anyway, Mrs. Thatcher pulled the funds on most of that sort of research. And so I, I then started, got involved in starting the London Wildlife Trust, which was a sort of a wildlife trust for Greater London. And yes. then I went to work for Friends of the Earth as their countryside campaigner. Yes. And so the NGOs, the, the campaign groups in those days, I mean, this was the, the early 90s, late 80s. We're, we're sort of this was the uh, very early 1980s, yeah. 1980s. So those organisations had existed for a while. I think Friends of the Earth was Friends set up Earth in 69 or something. But there, there was certainly a, a momentum of energy that came across environmental campaign groups around about the 80s. Was that evident when you joined Friends of the Earth? Or what sort of organisation was it you were joining? I wouldn't say it was. I mean, in the 19... In around 1970 was when there was the first Earth Day and that sort of wave. And that's what led to Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth being founded. But they remained very, very small. Um, they got bigger by the 1980s and done more campaigns, of course, by the early 80s. But it wasn't until the late 1980s, around 87, 89, that you got the sort of green wave explosion of public engagement with them. So when I joined them... There were 11 people when I went to work for Friends of the Earth in Friends of the Earth and about 30 volunteers. And although they had had to move to slightly larger premises one after another, it was still pretty small and it was very voluntary and very idiosyncratic. And the, the main reason I went to work for them was Des Wilson, who was a right. sort of no-nonsense New Zealand campaigner, a sort of arch-polarizer. And being a Kiwi, he was partly effective partly because he was manically driven, but partly because he wasn't at all intimidated by the British uh, sort of establishment system of deference to authority and the way things have been done. And I thought Des looked like he could get things done. That's why I went to work for them. Yes. Um, and I learned a lot about campaigning working there. Um, what sort of issues were you dealing yeah. with while you were there? Well, I was supposed to be the countryside campaigner, but being Friends of the Earth, they ran out of money. So I started off working on habitats and tax forestry and stopping, trying to stop people, um, trying to change the common agricultural policy so that it wasn't so damaging. Ran a campaign about straw burning in order to sort of try and help puncture the archer image of agriculture, which at the time was dominant. I mean, he even had, it was when the a Guardian journalist, when we were talking to her about them ripping up a meadow full of orchids somewhere in Suffolk or something, she said, but haven't we got to eat? And I thought, if this is the Guardian that's saying this, we've got a real problem. We've got yeah. to show that agriculture is actually, in intensive agriculture, is actually fundamentally damaging. So we looked at, I think we need a black and white thing that people will agree is wrong and then show agriculture is responsible for it. And so we looked at slurry and we looked at straw burning. And because straw burning critics involved an organisation called the um, National Farmers Union's Wives Organisation, I think it was called, um, a formidable who didn't like it because it screwed over the paintwork and the washing, we decided to go for straw burning. And then we were lucky. It was hot and windy and tragically people died on the road in accidents caused by straw burning mm. and it was massive the whole country was southeast of england and yeah. up to yorkshire was on fire and you got tourists saying why are you doing it you know and that was that was caused by uh joining the eu and then switching over to growing winter cereals so in the past people who'd cut the harvest in the autumn left the stubbles in the winter which is a little bit and then burnt the stubbles to kill the weeds 
um, but it still left lots of seeds and insects in the fields. And now yeah. they then they've gone over to get putting lots of fertilizer on, making it more intensive, using different varieties. You ended up with a lot more cereals, but with a lot of straw left over that they didn't have anything to do with. So they were just setting fire to it. And in other countries, they didn't do it. So we had a long argument, and in the end, we won. Yeah. Um, but partly by accident because of the weather. Which you can't control. But you did, I mean, out, out of an interest to address a particular area, a, a broader area, you did focus in on a very specific winnable issue, which is to quite To do something about the issue, yeah. Because this it, is already sort of like, well, you know, what sort of campaign tactics work? And, and this sort of thing that focusing in on the, the, the very visible, highly winnable issue seems to me to be one of the early examples of the sort mm. of approach that you've had. Yeah, I think you have to, that's an example of, the reason for doing it was to establish who was fundamentally right and who was fundamentally wrong before you tried to make specific demands for other changes. So to and to do it by using something which people could understand in a very black and white and in an intuitive way and just looking at it, it felt wrong. It had what I call grossness. I mean, when the whole landscape's on fire and all the hedges are going up in smoke yeah. and it didn't used to happen. And you say it doesn't have to be like this. They don't do this in Spain and other countries. Then you can win it on that basis. And then the next time you go back with something which is really too complicated for people to understand or too obscure in any detail, they're going to tend to agree with you because they've already decided that fundamentally you're probably right. But then I ended up working on that. Then they asked me to run the acid rain and pesticides campaigns yes. because they had money for those and they'd research them. So I had to then run two campaigns at once, Yes, which was, but I was young and it was fun and I was energetic. Of course, of course, absolutely. <laughs> and still are. Well, yes, yeah, not as energetic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. So... But it meant I had to learn about a whole load more stuff. Well, no, of course. And, and this is one of the challenges with any of these areas, isn't it? Because the issues get deep. I mean, there's, there's complexity at the heart of any of these mm. issues. And I know that one of the things that you said in, in some of the things that you've written about this area is the degree to which it's helpful for campaign groups to inform people and to educate people, but the degree to which if you're trying to mobilise people to get things done, there has to be a limit to that because there's a certain amount of information that motivates people to take action but if you go too far into the details it just motivates mm. people to get deeper and deeper and deeper into the, the technicalities of it and i kind of feel as though i certainly feel like i'm in that space sometimes with climate change now so i mean it, it, was that something that you realized through the successes that you'd had with the the straw burning and with the acid rain campaigns or is that something that you've developed over time looking back on all this. i think i learned a lot from everybody i've worked with who like i learned a lot from des for example about making things black and white and looking for the black and white thing and um so sometimes you'd be briefing des and he's going on tv to have a debate with the nfu or someone he stops making a point and he makes it more and more black and white and and he's saying no des that's the wrong way around it's actually all right and he just flips straight but he was just so good at it that sort yeah. of thing but so he he would probably have seen that as a technique or something but there's a principle behind what he was doing and then you know i think i've always been when i was young my dad gave me a book called the hidden persuaders by vance packard right. which was a sort of popular psychology penguin book at the time in the 60s probably or 70s and I think at that point, and that's what made me interested in, though I never did any academic work on it, in psychology and how people were influenced. And he gave me another book called The Shocking History of Advertising, which was a little penguin book and which is full of examples of how adverts work. Yes. And I think that it was seeing that and thinking, oh, right, there's a system behind these things. And this is how people are... If they're taking... If they're drawing conclusions and acting on advertising because of certain ways that they think, then the same thing must be happening to everything else that they do. And we ought to be trying to use those types of things in camp and not just trying to win arguments with facts. Yes. An argument, yes. you know. And this feels like 20 years earlier than... I mean, now there's so much about 
influence and, and how people are influenced and obviously we have, we've had whole elections fought on the thing that you don't need facts to win arguments and all of these sorts of things but it feels like these key messages have been around for some time but I, I suspect our understanding of how those techniques work has just gotten deeper and deeper over time does it get to a point where we become scarily too good at this stuff and you know f the whole concept of free will of people goes out the window because ultimately we can all have our levers pulled to be influenced by people who have these skills you know, this is jumping off sideways a little bit but well just... you know i i agree with george lakoff who's the famous frame framing popularizing academic from um, stanford i think and Lakoff, it was, he was became famous for sort of showing, trying to show the Democrats why they kept losing elections against the Republicans. He said the Republicans are much better at framing the debate, which partly means, you know, talking in terms that people already understand and enabling them to draw conclusions, you're right. Whereas if you talk in terms they don't understand, then, or they don't feel emotionally resonate with them, then they're not going to be able to agree almost with you, even if they want to. And... His famous example was about tax and um, investment, you know, so that if you frame something as tax, because tax has been framed, it's you, we use a mental box to think about tax, and that's the frame, and it's less is good, yes. not more is good. So it makes it a bad thing. So in lots of frames, as, as he points out, you know, up is good, down is bad. And a tax and down is where hell is, and down is... And these, he says that goes back to being a baby. And uh, so it's hardwired into us because you're cold on the floor and your mother picks you up and that's warm. So, you know, I'm a warm person, warm to the touch. I'm a cold person, makes me a bad person. So these are very deep things and they're automatic. And But Lakoff says you can't do anything fundamentally about this, but why should only some people know about these things? So he supports, he supported the idea of what he called a new enlightenment. Yeah. And I agree with him. I think that in the end is the only thing you can do because it's no good saying we're going to limit the, you know, we will stand back and not use these things. Well, you can't do that no. because everybody automatically does them anyway. Yes. I mean, I have people say that to me about value segmentation, about framing, about heuristics, about all sorts of other stuff like that, you know. But isn't this manipulation? I say, yeah, but, you know, if you're going out with your, uh, you want to impress your partner, you might put on makeup, you clean your hands, you might brush your hair. Why do you do, do those things? Time, to be yeah. nice to each other. Why? Because you want to be liked. Is that manipulation? Yeah, yes, yes. It's like, you know, and that's why it's very obvious if you have people with uh, some sort of mental difference which makes them not empathetic to other people and yes. they're not behaving like that. Yes. And that, you know, and that in some ways puts them at a social disadvantage because we're programmed to behave in a way that we sort of intuitively expect people, other people to behave. Yes. And yes. there's nothing we can do about that. No, absolutely. Let's go back into the timeline because I, I eased us out just because I followed that because I find it so interesting. From Friends of the Earth, you went to Greenpeace. Uh, and Well, in between, between Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace, I went to WWF International. Yes. And I learned a lot about communication internally, and internal politics from that, <laughs> being oh, okay. a big organisation. Yes. Um, and But also from... It was very heavily influenced. It started in '61. It was and it was started by a bunch of people, the business people, and people like Guy Monfort and um, David Ogilvy, who came from advertising. So right from the very beginning, they were using a lot of advertising type insights and techniques. Yes. And that was where I got there was somebody working there who showed me this thing that said uh, awareness, um, alignment, engagement, action, that it was a marketing thing, a bit like AIDA. Yes. And I thought you could apply that to campaigns. Of course. Yeah. So I did, and it seemed to work. Now, where he got it from, I don't know. But I mean, it was um, a guy called Paul, who was uh, American. And... So I just acquired things off other people that seemed to work and then tried to systematically use them, you know. And then after that, at the end of that, working at WWF, I, for a few years, 
there was a 25th anniversary of WWF and I had to help organize the big shebang you know get together for it and to make a film about its work and we didn't have enough money to make what I wanted to do and the film company I was working with said well this is a good cause because by then it was very fashionable it was about 87 88 around yeah. just before then and we'll ask the industry to give pro bono help and all our suppliers and they did and they say help we made a film it wasn't brilliant but it was much bigger than it otherwise would have been and they all these companies all said that was great we loved doing it when's your next project and we thought well if you can do that for wwf who really could afford the budget actually then why not help other groups who can't afford to get professional communications advice so we set up a charity which i ran for several years called media natura yes it doesn't exist now but it had about two thousand uh media companies everybody from hand artists for adverts through to stunt men to pr people to pollsters to well, the whole business to business uh community of, of communications and from them i learned a lot about how communications businesses actually work and i remember the first thing that really struck me going to meetings with these guys and women was like they weren't writing anything down and and then they get to the end and they write bullet points action points and they go so i'd be going like where is who's taking the minutes and they're going what do you mean minutes <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a business meeting it's not a parish council you know yeah. it's like we don't need minutes we just need to do things yeah and uh which was very different from the culture of a lot of ngos yes who, who'd adopted a sort of the sort of post-victorian model of local government type of level of you know and thinking in terms and still thinking in terms of using paper and letters yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. i mean it's interesting that what you say what you were doing through this period it seems to me was looking to other industries other types of people people who are involved with advertising people involved with management seeing what there was of value to the process of campaigning and, mm. and trying that out and taking that and i always say to people when i'm talking about what they might do in order to get better at what they do reading outside their narrow specialism is always how you get to be innovative in any particular area because you don't get innovative in campaigning by just looking at campaigns you get innovative by looking at what marketers do you get innovative at looking i don't know what you know all sorts of people do in remarkable situations where they have to come up with a an answer to a problem and and then think through well okay what what is the essence of that that maybe is transferable and it does seem to me that that's the heart of the innovation process that that you you were being exposed to um, by those early organisations, I guess. You did get to Greenpeace in the end. I did. And you were one of the prime movers of one of the iconic NGO campaigns, which was, which loomed large, um, certainly in my life at the time. I remember following it very closely, which was the, the Shell Brent Spa uh, campaign, which in many ways, I, I'm, I, this may be hyperbole in my memory, but I remember it this way and I look back on it this way. It, it very much transformed the image of NGOs in the popular mind or certainly the image of Greenpeace in the popular mind. It created this vision of NGOs directly challenging companies rather than lobbying governments and very much taking this sort of David versus Goliath role that immediately won huge amounts of sympathy from a significant audience. Um, so rather than me preamble it why why don't you just because my experience of talking to pe younger people about this is it's ancient history and mm. most of them don't know it just give us the outline of what was the Shell Brent Spa campaign well the Brent Spa was the oldest piece of uh, infrastructure in the North Sea and the North Sea oil fields were beginning by the 90s to come to the end of their scheduled life i mean they're still going now but they're gradually being dismantled and it was in the brent field and it was a, a thing like a giant biscuit tin like a sort of series of gas holders on one on top of each other suspended by chains attached to the bottom of the north sea and it was used to put oil in when from the first oil uh, drilling 
and then tankers will come along and take it away by the pumping it out down long umbilical sort of hose cords because it was the oldest thing it was going to be the first thing out because it was no longer it'd been replaced functionally by pipelines but to begin with there weren't any pipelines in the north sea and when uh wedgwood ben a, a labor politician was energy minister when they put a lot of this stuff in about 20 years before then they made a pledge that they'd get it all out they wouldn't leave it lying around at the bottom of the north sea afterwards um and then along had come a whole series of pollution laws passed by the EU and agreed by a thing called OSPAR, an international commission, um, covering one subject and another about toxic waste and dumping and emissions into the sea and so on. And oil installations had been given a special corner where they weren't really restricted, thanks to lobbying from the oil industry. And so this was going to be a test case of all these rules and laws. And the British government, unbeknownst to us, actually, had um, changed the tax, petroleum revenue tax and uh, other tax arrangements in such a way that it incentivized oil industries not to bring ashore and recycle these things, but to dump them at sea. It yes. made it cheaper. Yes. The result of that was that there was a whole industry um, of uh, companies like Hiramac and Smittac, mainly based in um, the Netherlands, whose business is moving big objects around at sea. So they'll have a thing in Singapore and then they're in Indonesia and then they can bring it around to Rotterdam or whatever and use it to drill oil or whatever they're doing. Part of their business was taking redundant stuff out and bringing it ashore to be recycled they were really cross to discover that they were having all their contracts cancelled because of this tax thing and so they leaked to greenpeace the information about what was going to happen that was how right. we knew about yes. the brent spa and the north sea ministers conference was happening at the same time in june 95 may june and the political unit in Greenpeace were looking for a way to dramatise what otherwise was a very boring meeting. And so they had this idea of, and this was in the very early days of the internet, um, of setting up a pirate radio station, like a pirate North Sea old style 60s pirate radio ship. Yes. Then they heard about the Brent Spa and they thought we could do it on the Brent Spa. And to make, we'd occupy it and by occupying it they wouldn't be able to sink it if we were still on it and i in the uk office of greenpeace was looking for something to show that the earth summit and all the fanfare that had been around the rio summit unsaid in 92 hadn't really made any difference to the way the government was acting in relation to large companies so when i was showing this thing and somebody because it was in the british sector of the north sea so i was in charge of the campaign somebody came and showed it to me and i looked at this diagram and i said what size is it and they said well it's the same height as the eiffel tower and it's uh, fourteen thousand tons or something i thought this is the biggest piece of litter in history yes. they can't possibly get away with it yeah. so although it didn't fit any of the sort of silos of campaigning Yes. did intersect with a few of them in Greenpeace. Um, it was something where you could see that this was, it had the potential to show that all of the stuff about sustainable development was a bit greenwashy unless you stopped allowing things like this to happen. Yes. So that's, that's essentially why we started doing it. That meant that there were several different strands of logic inside why we were doing it and um which became quite difficult to uh you know to separate one well not to separate stop them separating you know is it really about this or is it really about that and that's the sort of really is there a really question the reason what happened then was greenpeace went and occupied it because we knew there was a window between the towing season started in may ended in october it was too rough outside that season initially it was a big logistical operation to get onto this thing i mean it's closer to norway than it is to shetland and um hundreds of people involved several ships and shell um, completely surprised and uh nobody took any notice 
for quite a long time. So we were there for weeks without getting any press coverage or anything like that. And some people in Greenpeace started saying, well, it's not working. And But I was thinking, you know, this is because I'd studied the old Greenpeace campaigns when we were re-strategizing the UK bit of Greenpeace. And you could see that the thing that really struck you, although it was small in the 70s, was that what were looked back upon as famous campaigns, frequently nothing happened for weeks or months. And then something else would happen. And they nearly all involved ships. And partly that was because if a ship was going from A to B and A to B was thousands of miles away, it took weeks to get from one end <laughs> to the other. And But if you look back at the old telegrams, uh, the old communication, um, that you could see that not a lot had, had happened for weeks and weeks and weeks. By the 80s and 90s, people expected things to happen very quickly. Yes. And what one of the things that I thought Greenpeace and other people thought was doing that wasn't right was doing things that sort of fitted the media schedule. So like nine to five actions, you know, you'd, and they were often just banner hangs or something. Yes. They were making a statement. It was pictures first. And so we tried to change that round back to it being action first, pictures second, information third. And that was that hierarchy was uh, coined by a guy called Nick Galley, who was a genius of Greenpeace communication, uh, who came from advertising. And that's essentially, that's part of the reason we were attracted to the Brent Spa, um, because of who was involved, Shell. I mean, Shell had their name on it. Yes. It was 49% owned by Exxon but they didn't have their name on it, so Shell carried the can, literally. The public started to side with Greenpeace. In Germany, the church group started a boycott, not Greenpeace, but Greenpeace sort of did things that helped it happen, by like putting up large signs on the side of Shell installations. They, and it went ballistic for about six weeks. It was just constantly all over the media and on the front page of all the newspapers, there were all the politicians in European countries talking about it. I mean, you've got like the German p branch of Shell being called into the minister's office in Germany and told that you've no longer got a social license in this country. You're going to have to leave unless you change this decision. And um, the German police boycotting Shell petrol. I mean, right. this like humongous thing yes. that was yes. got spilled over. It wasn't anything. It wasn't being run by Greenpeace. It, was running itself yes and then eventually the international bit of shell decided it was more international than british and told the british bit to go home and tell john major that they're uh, giving in oh really yeah yeah and oh, wow. Did not so that. major had just stood up in parliament and said there will be no backing down these terrible people are bullies and you know and then he had to stand up about an hour later and say oh well they have backed down and so the government were incandescently furious. They kicked Shell, and then they turned around and started trying to attack Greenpeace. Yes. And um, then it transpired that after the decision had taken, and it didn't play any part in the uh, campaign, but it transpired that Greenpeace had made an estimate of how much oil might be in the top of the storage tank that was Which wrong. Was wrong yeah. No, I remember this. And Peter Melchett, who was my boss at the time, well, he's the executive director of the Greenpeace office, the UK office, was a sort of, you know, honourable public schoolboy, decided that he he needed to write and apologise. Yes. To, Didn't they do a Shell. press conference? Well, what happened was that Peter wrote this thing, and I pointed out to him, I said, you know, the word apologise, it could be. <laughs> and um, he wrote, I'm going to do it. And... So Peter sent his letter and the to the board of Shell UK, I think, saying it could have been misleading, you know, and we corrected it. And uh, and the BBC journalist wrote a piece which didn't really explain what had happened. It got concertinaed. So it just said, today Greenpeace apologised for the Brent Spa campaign. And what he had originally written was the Brent Spa campaign oil estimate mistake yes but he didn't write the estimate of oil in the brent spa campaign so it then spread around the world overnight the next morning i went to the office and it was like 
The receptionist looked as if she'd been electrocuted, frazzled, and there was just every phone in the building was ringing. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. These things can go. And it's interesting that, I mean, I, I was in business in a community some years later, and one or two of the senior business leaders who were involved with business in the community had been senior executives in Shell at the time that all this had happened. They were in different companies now that they were leading. And what they did convey was the sense of shell shock, ironically, uh, that they felt at the time. Because they felt, as engineers, as most of them were, they felt that they had the science right. Mm. And yet they completely lost the campaign. They lost the argument. And they thought, how can it possibly be that the science is on our side? And I'm sure you'd have a different view on that. But they were totally convinced that science was on their side. But they lost the argument anyway, and and it was, it was an it was an it had ripples throughout a whole range of businesses. I think mm. who saw that and suddenly became much more alert to the possibility that just because they think they have their facts lined up means nothing in the world of persuasion of how these things work, how stakeholders work, and so on. And it was certainly quite influential then, I think, in how a number of them responded to subsequent NGO campaigns. I've certainly uh, you know, gone through a phase where I've seen companies have been much quicker to respond. At least a generalisation, much quicker to respond to well-founded NGO pressure than obviously governments were ever able to be because they're just so much more slower mm. moving. And I, and I did feel that this was like the... The first domino, in some ways, that that really became part of that trend. Do you see it that way, or am I? Did I make that, that up? No, no, the that definitely happened. Um, of course, there were lots of examples before then of um, companies leading, but then governments following and backfilling, which became a much much bigger thing in the sort of you know the popularity of the sort of neoliberal model you know we do, we don't actually have to lead or deliver governments we'll just organize a marketplace and the market will fill in everything yeah. meet all the consumers needs it will b behave in an environmentally responsible way because it's in its own interest to do so and blah 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 which now has fallen somewhat out of favor but yeah. there were always times when businesses there were things that businesses did with social issues sometimes where individuals often with private companies because they didn't have the shareholder thing to worry about would yeah. do the right moral or ethical thing because of the individual's concern so for example hoffman roche very uh, controversial company with some drugs uh, scandals of things where they covered up when i worked for wwf i used to regularly see luke hoffman who's took the family's money and used it to set up the tour de the land nature reserve and research thing in the camargue and People would tell a story about Luke with um, one of the, I can't remember what the drug was, but it was something that was very scandalous, um, where the advisors and the accountants and the lawyers were coming to them when they were under pressure and he, they were saying, you know, you can get out of it this way and get out of it that way. And he said, no, no, is it, are we right or are we wrong? Yeah. And they said, well, it depends what you mean. He said, well, no, morally, are we right or are we, oh, is what these people are saying right? And they went, well, yes. And he said, right, then we pay. And he just forced the company to pay. But he could because I think he owned nearly all the, sh he owned more than half the shares or something. Yes. So that sort of thing had always happened. And when I worked at Greenpeace before the Brent Spa, I think there were, um, John Sovan, the current director, was. He was very successful at negotiating about when we worked on forest campaigns with pulp and paper companies, which he went on doing for years after I, after I left, um, face to face. And he, I remember he had instances of turning people around who were chief executives of companies. Sometimes they were the owners, sometimes they weren't. Yes. And um, But the, Brent, the thing about the Brent Spa, the reason that it resonated so much was... There were two things, I think. One is Shell's a very big company, fifth largest company in the world or something at the time. And so it was a sort of big blue chip thing. And they said, we lost the social license to operate and we must change as a result. Now, the subsequent attempts to change were quite, start with quite energetic. And then eventually they sort of gave up, I think. Um, 
companies find change management but, just as yeah, hard as anyone it's else. A lot, it's yeah. a lot harder than this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then but the other reason was that it called into question who ran the country. So, And that was not at all our intention of running the campaign because normally, of course, campaigns like the Brent's Bowl be lost. Yes. But this time it was won. Yes. And so the public and international opinion and the company that we were campaigning against all sided against the British government. The British government lost and was shown to be powerless. This really offended the conventional political class. Of course. And you got people like Douglas Hurd, who I think was a foreign minister, you know, foreign secretary writing things about, you know, dark forces and the end of democracy and all this sort of thing. And that's why it sort of wouldn't go away. And it made the uh, it, people didn't know what to think about it. Yes. And that is an example of a friend of mine uses who does qualitative research that, you know, in a campaign, if people can easily make up their minds, so you and I debate something, we agree to disagree because we can't agree, or we can clearly see why, or you convince me I agree with you. End of story, end of conversation. It doesn't spread, doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. If, on the other hand, we can't decide what we think and we've got a dilemma we can't deal with, and then we can think maybe we ought to ask Mabel around the corner and my great aunt Sally, now the thing spreads. Yes. And that was what the Brent's Bar was like because it was asked questions that nobody could really answer, including the politicians and the NGOs. And it went on being like that for quite a long time. You know, is it the end of history? Do we need politics or not? You know, all of those, it was that sort of stuff. That's why it really resonated, I think, by yes. accident. Yes, yes. Looking back on your time with the, the various NGOs that you've worked directly with, we've touched on a number of things that led campaigns to be effective. If you look back on that, were there any other things that you felt, you know, what you now talk about in terms of what works and what doesn't? Were there any other things that came out of that time that you saw, yeah, well, these were lessons about what worked or lessons about what didn't? Mm. Well, I think one thing is that campaign organisations, like any organisation, are a bit like animals or breeds of dog or something. So, you know, I can try and get my Staffordshire Bull Terrier to go and sniff out a ball but she probably won't find it whereas I had a Springer Spaniel it will find anything by smell because they're just better at it but then it wasn't so good at other things yeah. and so you can sometimes see situations where NGOs campaign groups are trying to converge or all adopt the same tactic or think and I in the end those you've got horses for courses that they're not Culturally, it's very difficult to change them, often very unwise to try and change them. Yes. And I think that they often they're founded around one really good tactic that can be used to form strategy, as Sun Tzu said, as you know, wrote a strategy of tactical positioning. So with Amnesty International, it was Benison's insight when he sat in that church in Piccadilly and thought, what can I do about these people wrongfully imprisoned, I think, under a dictatorship in Portugal? All I can do is to tell them I know they're there and I'm thinking of them. So he wrote yes. a letter. Yes. And I worked for a year or two with Amnesty as a consultant. We were trying to find a new tactic as good as that that would help inform their brand and strategy, and we never did. And I think with Greenpeace it was non-violent direct action, but telling people about it and yes. showing it to them. Yes. Whereas the French, who went, uh, the French, the Quakers, who went into the Pacific against French nuclear testing, did almost exactly the same thing. They didn't tell anybody and they all got beaten up. And so right. it had very little effect. Yes. Greenpeace did it and it took people like, I don't know if he was on those things, but people like Bob Hunter, who's a journalist, and their instinct was to tell everybody about it. Yes. And they knew how to tell people about it. And then you got people like David McTaggart came into Greenpeace, who was an organiser, who's a businessman. He wanted to make things bigger and better and was quite esteem driven. He wanted success. He was interested in challenging power because he liked power. Yes. And so then that was adding another component, which was the sort of motivators of people. Yes. If you don't have the people who want to make the thing bigger and better, it doesn't become bigger and better because most of the people who just think it was interesting who started it want to go on to do the next interesting thing. Yes. And, and that's, that's and that's interesting as well because 
these organisations take on a dynamic of their own, and uh, to some extent, that can be helpful, and it can, and, and it can be an obstacle as well. I mean, I always wondered about some of the organisations. I mean, Greenpeace, for instance, which um, achieved fame through daring exploits and attracted a lot of supporters and presumably funding that follows all of that, which enables you then to do other things. The pressure then comes on to keep doing what made you famous because people that's why people are supporting you. Mm. And so when you get into a situation where maybe a quieter approach might be more effective from a campaign point of view, it might be something that the organisation sidesteps because ultimately it's it has a constituency that it has to satisfy in order to attract the funding. Friends of the Earth is a membership organisation and obviously the members throughout that have particular things that they care about, so their ability to run campaigns that their members don't think about must be relatively constrained. And you can push back against these obstacles and overcome them to some extent, but people do follow incentives. How, how much does the structure of how NGOs get funded and how they get support from a wider audience, how much... In your experience, has that ever constituted an obstacle that really made a difference to the ability to actually be effective in making change? I had never encountered a situation in Greenpeace when I worked with them where he did anything in order to raise money, campaign-wise. I've subsequent there was subsequently, and I stopped working for them full time around two thousand say. Um, um, I've been involved with them doing jobs since, and, I've, and I also haven't seen that. But there have been NGOs, I think there's been a fashion since, or a trend, amongst some campaign NGOs to put the responsibility for raising a certain amount of money from campaigning in the same project as spending the money on the campaigning, which I personally think is a mistake for, lot, for lots of reasons that we could spend another entire session talking about yeah um but there's a lot of other reasons why things do and don't work and i think although people are people will often latch on to money and partly because it's an easy sounds like an easy thing to talk about because it can it gives a sort of spurious air of objectivity because it's quantified and um and it makes anything which makes things easier to talk about is likely to get used or done more you know in the same way as the media will pick the best known example of something to characterise the whole, represent the whole thing. Yes. And people will do that as well. So if you work for Oxfam in development or Greenpeace, you're used to people thinking anything good that happened in those thing, in those sectors must have been done by your organisation because you're the one that springs to mind, whereas poor old friend of the earth or something more obscure in development doesn't get mentioned because yes. people aren't quite sure, so they pick the th recall the thing that... But there, there are lots of my point about the organizations being like different animals really is that the suite of tactics and strategies that they can use very effectively, which is sort of in the same way as a fungus is mycelium helps feed a tree and the tree helps feed the mycelium of the fungus. Both sugars going one way and minerals going the other way. The two things to be healthy, you need both things together and the the community around an organisation is getting stuff from it emotionally, a utilitarian way, in an exchange way, in all sorts of ways, and giving things to it at the same time. And that's why they're, they're a bit like belief systems or churches, you know, or lots of other organisations like that, where there's a lot of non-material exchange of value yes. and effort. Um, but it... So they might all be using email or something, or they might all be doing blogging, or they might all be, um, I don't know, doing something, some other thing tactically. But it's doing different things in different organisations. And so the idea that you're going to go out and find a, you know, that one, it all depends on some magic bullet and who gets it, I think is wrong. Yeah. You know. Do you get a, I, I get a sense that maybe it's the case that for mainstream NGOs, campaigning NGOs, are, are not as effective now as they used to be. And that's a horribly subjective thing to say. There's no uh, data behind that at all. And I, and I expect 
you would be reluctant to speculate in those terms, but what do you think of the challenges that face for professional campaigners who are sort of followed after you for, for the coming decade to be to continue to be effective? That's a good question. And it, it's always very difficult to, you know, attempts to find some objective measure of those truths is quite it's quite a difficult thing because they you know there's even measuring that sort of thing is a sort of wicked process um and i think i mean in the certainly one of the big things that happened was there was a subsidy to ngos of mass media that disappeared when you got multi channels and then you got the internet and then you got social media and then you get like so more and more narrow casting because people saw things incidentally they didn't intend to see right so you'd be waiting for match of the day and uh there would on come a trailer for a david attenborough thing or something and but if you were just going to choose between 20 different subjects and one was sport and one was nature and you didn't choose nature you'd never see attenborough and when that disappeared i think that that probably didn't help yes some of the especially some of the bigger more established ngos who got used to relying on got good at the ways of operating in the mass media world and the i mean there's a contemporary thing is the fashion for or the trend for um thinking all you really need to do is movement building yes and before that it was all you what you really need to do because of the way brands work in social media is storytelling and before that it was well actually for a bit in some organizations it was the stuff i was involved in about values you know you've got to think about and and psychology and applying that to and you know but it's hard to know whether or not um one of the reasons it's quite hard is that the they're a bit like uh organizations who do like the, a lot of the communications industry i mean they used to have what they call job bags in design studios and things where at the end of the job you just sweep everything into this large bag <laughs> And then you might keep it for a month or two, but then they probably recycle it or throw it in the skip. And NG these campaign NGOs are very, very bad at retaining knowledge and records and things yes. quite often. Partly because they're just not resourced to doing it. Yes. In a way, it's a bit like expecting the fire brigade or paramedics to, have, who probably do keep quite a lot of records, but. They're essentially, because they have this sort of, the campaign groups have this sort of frontline mentality and strategy quite often. They tend to, it's like, in that respect, they're like the, the news media. So yesterday's gone. You know, yesterday might as well have been 10,000 years ago. Yes. It's only today that counts. So you never layer learning on top of prior learning to, 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 to build it's quite something hard that's to get institutionally stronger. It's always new in that sort yeah, of it's hard to it's hard to get them to do it because there's the sort of cult of the new and they, they're just not resourced to um, often retain a lot of past, you know, and articulate and use a lot of past knowledge, I think. Yes. You've recently released a very extensive and detailed assessment of the, the recent climate campaigns, tragedy or scandal strategies of Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion and the new climate movement. Now, open disclosure, I've been very critical of Extinction Rebellion almost from the beginning for various reasons, some of which I saw echoed in, in what you wrote. But you have a huge amount more experience than I do on the sort of campaign effectiveness of how do you describe what the Extinction Rebellion, specifically at the moment, we'll talk about the, the other stuff soon, uh, what the Extinction Rebellion campaign strategy has been to date and how do you rate its effectiveness? Hmm. Well, it's an interesting question is whether or not Extinction Rebellion's strategy has actually changed. They've produced a new strategy document that is very vague and my question always about a strategy being changed if anyone tells me they've refreshed their strategy all these other things that people say whether they're government departments or an ngo or whatever is so what aren't you doing any longer 
yes. what's gone and what's been stopped. And if they sort of haver around and go, well, there's a bit of a bit, maybe a bit more emphasis and working on this and reaching out to that, you know that it isn't really. It's changed at all. It's just drifted along and people are talking about it differently. Yes. Um, or whatever. So I don't know quite. And now they're talking about more. This is in the UK. Extinction Rebellion UK. Yes. They're talking about more decentralization and localization. Now, whether or not that means that there's any more change to it than that, I don't know. The original strategy was actually, I thought, quite an impressive piece of work. Um, in, in So I'm talking about the evolution of the papers that were written by Roger Hallam with other people, about 12 or 13 other people. Um, I don't know how much the others did. From uh, rising up and um, a couple of other small, the radical think tank, and these things were just a handful of people, um, and then became the uh, blueprint for Extinction Rebellion 2018-19. And this involved the mass civil disobedience. It involved deliberate uh, disruption based on transposing the logic of... Uh, what appeared to be successful in non-violent resistance to dictatorships and totalitarian governments in research by Erika Chenoweth, the American political scientist. Yeah. Um, and the use of a whole collection of bits and pieces from organising theory and uh, the sort of stuff that Marshall Gantz and people made famous and um, psychology to some of which is quite culty and manipulative in order to try and attract, organize and uh, channel people into this rebellion. The thing which they made hides in plain sight because it was made clear if you looked at the yeah, details yeah. of what they were saying was that this was intended to overthrow the government or yes. to force it to accede to their demands. It was a bit vague about the distinction. Um, but the front line that people would take away, the top line, was about tell the truth, act like it's true, declare a climate emergency. It wasn't we're here to overthrow the government. That was what some of them were saying, but not many of them. Now, yes. it, is it an organisation? Well, it's a movement, you know, but some of it is very like an organisation and other bits are, are not at all like an organisation. I always thought part of the challenge for them, and I'm perfectly happy for them to be challenged, because I don't agree with overthrowing the government, was that the founders had that initial vision that you'd sort of identified. Most of the people who signed up, joined, just were concerned about climate change. Mm. They weren't recruited on the basis that this was about overthrowing the government. They were recruited on the basis that this would be an effective way of forcing people to take action on climate change. And in some ways, it's the gulf between the founding vision and what the movement actually thought they were there for that has probably given them problems in more recent times with now, you know, one of the original founders, Roger Hallam, becoming rather controversial within the movement and them dis trying to decide what on earth they do about this. And, and in many ways, that was surely going to happen because the majority of people joined did not realise what the original vision was mm. that they were joining up for. Well, I got I got the impression actually looking from looking at Roger's some of the things that Roger Hallam had said uh, on tape uh, in videos, and including your interview with him, which I thought was excellent, um, that he thought he had a very limited window of opportunity to try and make it work, and I suspect that that's because he thought what you're describing would happen if they didn't sort of break down the wall or get through the door quickly enough because the longer people have to sit around and debate and discuss something the more they're liable to start pulling in different directions yes. and his his recipe for dealing with difficult people as he put it in one of his videos which is worth a watch um i have a lot of sympathy with but it's a technique for doing that for for avoiding people who want to have a sort of reflective intellectual discussion about what to do and just getting people to get on with doing something um 
my main arguments with the more I looked at it, I thought the stranger this thing appeared. You see, I mean, I didn't set out to you know, criticize Extinction Rebellion when I first heard about them. I thought, oh, great, you know, the cavalry's arrived. New new people are going to be getting involved in this thing, which badly needed that, you know. And they succeeded admirably in uh, being a sort of porous, open thing that anyone concerned could join and participate in in a way that a lot of no, none of the other established NGOs, despite their best efforts, maybe, had managed to do. And the same goes for the school strikes, who I think are a much more significant body yes. than Extinction Rebellion. But Extinction Rebellion is more like a campaign organisation. Um, so it's quite relevant to other NGOs and political parties and things in a way that so the school strikes are sort of one step removed the whole time because they've really you know they really are just a large-scale manifestation of feeling and demand and emotion but they're not doing instrumental things like blocking particular things or you know yes being disruptive or, or that sort of thing apart from the sheer scale of their events yes um so i think socially they're much bigger effect on how people are feeling and thinking because of the whole business about the fact that it's children Anyone who's a parent has an immediate emotional reaction to that. It's, they can't, you know, makes them much more uncomfortable with thinking, you know, this is this true, what we're doing to all of us, to all the younger generation, um, yes. the children, you know. How... Which Extinction Rebellion doesn't. They're much easier to reject or to ignore or have a reason about agreeing with them or not. Yes. Yes. They don't. Although they try to draw the link, don't they? Because they, they have the, the, the blood of our children events. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is feels to me, I mean, it's, it's quite, I wouldn't say hackneyed exactly, but I mean, they, you know, it's started by people who are expert in street theatre quite famously. And they say it's not street theatre, it's mythic. Well, you like to say it's mythic, but it looks like people in red pyjamas to me. I mean, they came here to down the end of the road to uh, on 24th of December and good luck to them you know there were nice people from Norwich I think who were doing it for the right motives and they were marching around doing a thing about sea level rise I mean you know we've been flooded several times since we've lived here not my house but other people people know about sea level rise in Wales next to sea not surprisingly yeah. Yeah. um and there's huge meetings about it, you know, so it's a sort of slightly odd thing to do. But then that's partly because it's very decentralised. And they did some very unwise things, I think, in Cambridge, you know, recently. But then again, that's because partly if they're going to let anybody use their name, the brand, yes. then any people can do that sort of thing. Is, isn't this why leaderless movements which have you know a certain power because they attract certainly in the early stages wide participation but leaderless movements because of their tendency un to be unable to follow a strategy to be unable to engage with what's going to work and what isn't going to work in terms of persuading a target audience that they are prone to doing things that are counterproductive and, and actually putting more people off or putting certain people off who they should have been targeting putting those people mm. off rather than attracting them and that you've got to look at extinction rebellion and say well there's been now numerous occasions whether it's canning town whether it's for cambridge lawn where you can see that people are doing things without particularly thinking about them which is what ha is what comes of the nature of the beast a leaderless movement encourages a thousand flowers to bloom but unfortunately the ones that will attract attention will be the ones that create conflict. And creating conflict can be great if it's very well chosen, as the shelf of the Brent Spa uh, illustrates uh, in enormously. But if it's done without care, then it could simply alienate people, polarise opinion in a way that's not particularly helpful to what should be your objectives. And the question, I suppose, is the original founders had very specific objectives, which get 3.5% of people lined up then we can overthrow the government and maybe you didn't need to persuade some of the others but surely that's not how we see the advance of of, of movement on climate change really happening well i think there's a lot of problem there's several different things in there i mean i think we have we have to be careful about like backcasting um whatever the word is seeing in retrospect you know people like 
you mentioned the Brent Spa was well chosen. I mean, if it hadn't worked in inverted commas, nobody would be saying. We that. would be saying. Well, you know, it's it like, I mean, some Brent Roman Spa. general said that strategy is where planning meets luck. You know, so if it worked, then people analyse it. They then claim yes. they were involved in it if they can, and they will then say it was a brilliant strategy. If it didn't work, nobody remembers it. It may have been exactly the same strategy and it may have been the same tactic and it just didn't fail, but it only gets remembered by the things that either went really badly wrong in terms of causing a reaction that wasn't wanted yes. or were, were, were seen to have worked. I mean, I think that one of the things that Extinction Rebellion as a leaderless movement-ish, you know, um, struggles with and has it's like focusing resources and efforts and moments but they have done quite well i think in the way that they form their sort of regenerative cycle of saying you know we're going to come together for this week or this day because that is at least creating in the same way as glastonbury's audience always goes to glastonbury or it's the weekend we're going to go and watch football um, that's creating a degree of leadership through organisation and uh, logistics, like, you know, and and feeding and sustaining something of a community. Now, whether or not that community is getting bigger or smaller as a result of these other things, I don't know. But I thought their design has been quite clever in that and a lot of other ways. They've done a lot of work on NVDA and, and training people. So where it could that could have gone terribly badly wrong for them if they'd had people being violent in there. And yes. as far as I know, they never have. Um, no. And that's quite hard to achieve, especially with large numbers of people, especially if you can just pitch up and you've yes. got people who are maybe just like some version of self-appointed anarchists who just want to have a Barney yes. who are attracted to something. Now, they've, they've done a really good job in stopping that from happening. The thing that even if you have... The thing I don't know what they're going to do about is with the decentralization thing is if you have everybody doing their own, say, action against a fossil fuel related target rather than just a government related target, as they have been doing, how are they going to make that affect uh, the political system at every and any level in a way that actually leads to hastening real change beyond putting things on the agenda because everything already is on the agenda that yes. you can think of to do with climate change um, if you're going to have hundreds of little tiny actions happening in different places at different times that are by and large not going to rise above the surface of people's perception or register or if they are locally they're not understood in the context of so like in cambridge a few weeks ago they didn't just dig up trinity college lawn where there is an ongoing debate i think with that college and other colleges about disinvestment from fossil fuels and in that sense it's you know there's arguments to be made in favor of doing what they did um and probably against it but they also blocked bus lanes being the thing which would most bring Cambridge to a halt. Now, why was that thought to be a good idea? That's I find that the one which is... And they block roads, even though knowing, as in other places, that ambulances and emergency vehicles would get round it. But then yes. they found themselves sort of, dist, you know, drawn into a debate about that. And was the ambulance turning round? Was it on? Was it blue flashing light on? I mean, it's just basically, tactically, you don't want to go to those places if no. you're trying to achieve things. Those are all waste of time things, really. So I don't know how they're going to settle down and resolve that, or if they'll split into lots of different things, this or in, will they continue? I don't yeah, know. And this, in many ways, has, has been my concern because they do a lot of catastrophizing, um, you know, cherry picking the the the, the doomerism mm. end of the science, and suggesting to children that you may not grow up suggesting to parents their children might not grow up if you're going to catastrophize to that degree the fear is always that when you don't make any breakthroughs in the first couple of years that one of those splinter groups follows the logic of that argument i mean the logic of that argument says well we have to do something more extreme mm. you know in a way that you know the, the campaigns of previous years has has generally not you know the environmental movement's been a very book led movement groups like friends of the earth and greenpeace were keen to be able to stick to the facts 
by and large, everyone has some slip ups and all that kind of thing. But the intent was always there to retain credibility by being factually broadly accurate. When you get to a thing where it's about, well, no, you know, this is extinction. This is, you know, now or never. And, and, and if we don't do this by 2025, then our children are not going to have a future. That message has inbuilt a growing level of desperation. And it seems to me always great that they've done all this MBDA training and there's been no violence. I worry about the sheer logic that where that pushes, mm. because surely sooner or later somebody follows the incentives and says, well... Well, the thing, you know. I mean, the thing which I most criticised them for in the piece I wrote was for their, what I would call, solutions denial. So they systematically, if you think about trying to draw people into a funnel which puts them on a pathway to joining this rebellion, right? You, there are things which could distract them. So they've given them blinkers. And one of the blinkers is about the solution. So it's, there are no solutions. So nothing's worked. Nobody's doing anything. Nothing's happening. And that's one, that's one overlap, actually, with Greta Thunberg's rhetoric, which I yes. think, where I think she's wrong as yes. well. Nobody's doing um, anything. It's patently untrue. How else does she arrive at events by electric car? You know, we've decarbonized electricity massively in this country. But not if you listen to Extinction Rebellion. Token efforts, they said, nothing's happened. What we haven't done is decarbonised domestic heating. We haven't decarbonised transport. We haven't decarbonised air or ground transport. So, And we haven't decarbonised agriculture in the sense of decarbonising being, you know, reducing overall greenhouse gas emissions. That's a scandal. But the reason it's a scandal is it could be done. Where's the proof it could be done? What we've done in electricity. So you need to, you need, in order to get change, you need to show that change is possible. You need proof. Yes. Then it becomes avoidable. That yeah. makes it a scandal. That makes people angry. If it's just a tragedy, that's why I called it scandal or tragedy. Yes. If it's just a tragedy, everyone shakes. The world's full of tragedy. You can't do anything about it. Children dying from this, that and the other. Plagues, diseases, earthquakes, they all cause tragedies. But if it was avoidable, coronavirus at the moment is a tragedy. It's not really avoidable. We can mitigate it. Yes. If somebody somewhere was sitting on a vaccine and not letting you have it, that would be a scandal. We'd get something done about that a lot quicker. Yes. And yes. That's, that's, what, that's how they need to campaign at a strategic level. They need to be helping those sorts of campaigns. And the NGOs and the renewables industry and all the academics, all the knowledge area that's been built up, around that those things knowing what the solutions are which is not being effectively delivered through campaigning because there isn't enough public engagement in it that could be harnessed with the connected somehow a bit to the movement better yes. aligned that would make a big difference the other big thing is their gloom picking as i call it it's not cherry picking of science because they have by and large cited if you read the details of what they say a pretty accurate picture of the overall climate science but uh, what they it depends if you i mean roger hallam has been known to on oh yeah, BBC yeah. Go yeah i know yeah far there have wide. been there have been cases where he's made things up and he yeah. and i think frankly he he sort of seems to like exaggerating even his own opinions which is extraordinary and unfortunately those then yeah they're the bits so, that get, yeah. yeah exactly the six billion and things like yeah. that but what they've done is to systematically go through and pick out the gloomiest bits of papers and not the other bits of the papers which were talking about what could be done about it and what's feasible. Yes. So that's what I call gloom picking. Um, and then there's the idea that, uh, which, you know, a bit more like Jem Bendel, a chap who, from Cumbria, who yeah. wrote, you know, wrote about, we're all doomed, it's too late. And and telling which it's possible that that is true but there's not really any very firm evidence that that's true no and i did a so, review of gem's paper and, and i'm told it jumped from yeah a, a bit of stuff about how bad climate change is which was relatively non-specific and then a jump to and therefore human extinction and you're saying shouldn't there be a mm. bit in the middle here where that goes on to prove that and there was nothing it wasn't that yeah. it, you disagreed with it it just wasn't there well anyway though and i think it's immoral and un unethical to do what and i've said so what rupert's been doing which is you know telling 
audiences of quite young children that they might be going to die and are not going to grow up. It's that, it's that bad. Yeah, it could be that bad, but you don't know if it definitely is or not. There isn't any way of telling whether or not we're going to go into a cascade of one tipping point affecting another and get a runaway effect or something. And that's why, and I think that that, is dangerous the reason i think is wrong is because of a i don't think it's effective going to be particularly helpful in causing change but b i think it can have a significant effect on young especially young people's mental health but also older people when you put it with the solutions denial thing they're they're and then they're promoting uh you know engagement with a community of therapists who particularly focus of whom, of course, this is anything you can do therapy on is like, you know, moss to a flame. They want to go there. So it attracts people who like dealing with a human therapy needing problem rather than dealing with cow farts and yes. the energy industry yes. and how we build buildings, which is what's causing climate change. And that's a substitute. That's a strategic mistake, I think. So let's just briefly talk about climate change more broadly then as a as a campaign problem that we all mutually face. Forget Greta and Extinction Rebellion for a moment. We have the US deeply polarised on a party political basis on the issue. We have the UK with a Conservative government committed to, you know, the most radical programme of any of its predecessor governments and as much as anyone in the world, more or less, is currently committed to. There are Republicans in the US trying to gently draw their party back into the mainstream tricky at the moment given where things are but they they just launched a you know a new climate policy they're trying to do that there are some Tories in the UK pushing back against net zero because you know they, they see it as fundamentally anti-conservative we have businesses making bold commitments and we have another group of businesses that would really like to sort of rein back on all of this sort of thing so we have lots of different actors in the world lots of potential but there are forces and there are counter forces going in, in different directions. If we were drawing, you and me right now, the, the sort of campaign strategy for the world to move to the next level of progress on climate change, what do we make of those forces and counter forces? What, what would be the effective way forward for us? Mm. I ask you this because it's obviously an easy question to answer. Mm. Well... I think one thing which, you know, a lot of people, myself included, have thought for quite a long time that is when the weighting starts to change in terms of where uh, return on investment is going to come from in relation to energy in the energy sector, that, that is going, it won't just be a sort of, it's more like a catastrophe curve than just a, a straight line. And that that has, I mean, nobody predicted, nobody in inverted commas, predicted that how fast um, solar PV uh, costs would fall because they didn't anticipate its mass production in China and the strategic decisions that the Chinese made around wanting to dominate that market. Yeah. Um, once that happened, you then, you know, that's why you've got, even with all the embedded um, power of vested interest to entrenched, you, you end up with stranded assets and um, all of those, all of those sorts of things. And I think that, you know, the, the big opportunity is to uh, get, and the big difficulty is how do you get it, is to get the trajectories of developing countries and emerging economies changed rather than the the you know the national problem that we have in this country which is intricate and complicated and involves loads and loads of individual property owners and people which is like sort of a mass national diy exercise of backfitting one of the oldest industrial economies in the country so it's like the same, it's a sort of like going into, do you pull down the Houses of Parliament and build a better one, which would be a lot better. Yes. Um, but it wouldn't be the same, would it? So we all want to keep the old Houses of Parliament and we end up building it from the inside like one of those sort of maggots that is a parasite and eats the, in, yes. the insect yes. from the inside, but the outside of it looks much, exactly it? the same. Yeah. Yeah. But it's only a facade yeah. and um, everything else inside it gets changed. And... Yeah. 
that's the problem that we have as a really old country, especially a quite conservative, socially conservative one that likes to hang on to lots of old stuff. Yes. Um, but of course, we only represent going forwards a relatively small percentage. So what happens in other countries that can change much bigger and much faster, like in India? And in India now, there is there are signs that even the assumptions made, well, from the stuff I read about, written by Indians about India, um, a few, two or three years ago, about how long the coal is going to be being used rather than going over to solar and things, yes. are seeming to be wrong. So it's changing faster and faster. Um, what you do beyond energy is a lot less clear because the thing about the energy market in a way is it's relatively simple compared with say something like agriculture. Agriculture is a lot more diversified and complicated and localized and energy has, you know, got a few massive companies, got a few dominant technologies yes. like now is it going to be, you know, for transport, is it going to be a lot of electricity or is it going to be hydrogen made from electricity and, you know, is that only going to happen in countries with existing distribution networks, otherwise stranded assets from methane distribution and so on. But it's a simpler problem at any scale than what you do about um, la emissions from land use and farming and things. So I don't know, but um, I think that the diver you know the the getting a weight of action in countries other than the old industrialized countries is going to be a very important thing. And then finding, I mean, if somebody, if we could find a series of dumb technologies which used, which helped satisfy people's needs and aspirations, and which in the course of being used in a dumb way, in other words, without much requiring organisation and much regulation and things, had a positive effect on the in on the climate in the same way as petroleum and fossil or fossil fuels have a negative effect yes that would be fantastic if the technologists could if there was such a thing you know because then you didn't nobody organized pollution of the atmosphere no, of course not. no. but it happened nevertheless because it was it gave lots of conveniences and things and yes. then of course there was a bit of lobby about continuing to do it yeah sure of well, course as soon as you've created an edifice so yeah. someone will want to defend it but, but of course this is part of a, a challenge as well with the messaging with people who refuse to acknowledge that you know as a, as, as a species the human race has achieved some remarkable good things over the last century you know removing vast numbers of people out of extreme poverty and creating astonishing innovation and technology and, and civilization however you variously define that in different parts of the world and all of that has been good except that scale produces negative consequences that you now have to deal with with the next round of technology to keep the good things whilst tackling the unintended consequences but it doesn't seem to be the way that we end up talking about it. When when we get these debates, you will get Piers Morgan, bless his heart, saying, well, if you've got a television and you're an environmentalist, then you're a hypocrite. And we, we get into this ridiculous debate about the way forward is asking, what are you prepared to give up? And of course, it doesn't mean to say that there aren't any trade-offs at all. But nevertheless, the way that we zero in on that as being the question opposed to how do we organise our systems in a way to remove these negative impacts and to improve our situation. It feels to me that's one of the main barriers because where you make it easy for people to split on party lines is when these discussions become parodies of what the real discussions actually should be. And, and I don't know how you break that, how you break that to make it into a, a, a sort of conversation that Conservatives will say, ah, oh, yes, What's now being talked about goes to the heart of what I believe, and I'm pr prepared to line up behind it. It feels to me that's missing from the conversation. You know, I, I think one thing that helps is not to talk about climate change generically, because the because it's very large and very complicated, and people sort of know that. Um, 
that leads you, unless you're having a purely scientific discussion actually about climate change, which when people use the impression they're not talking about climate change per se, not talking about like, you know, meteorological phenomena, they're talking about the consequences of and the things you might have to do to stop climate, human made climate change. Breaking it down into um, more smaller more specific things like you know what are we going to do about sea level rise and land use what are we going to do about greener farming what are we going to do about um electrification you know so i mean if i was dominic cummings and um eddie what's his lister whatever his name is and boris and his people we we're trying to think if this was our problem i would think about be thinking about things like well why don't we you know how about talking about the great electrification of britain or you know so you turn it into a sort of tasks that people can align to yes. and then design it in such a way that it helps meet different people's needs and their prior psychological social priorities so they can be happy with backing it the same as they are with the national health service there's you know a climate equivalent of the health service would be talked about in a different way from just being trying to talk about same way as health you know the conversation you'd have if you went and tried started having one about health is different from the one you'd have if you talk about the nhs because the nhs is a service provision thing that we've all invested in and you know yeah and so once you get down to things which are about change and where there are benefits and the doesn't require lots and lots of arcane scientific knowledge in order to have a fairly equal discussion between lots of people. I think it becomes a lot of the political problem, the problem about politicisation of climate change and value splits and things, um, more easily goes away. You know, yeah. So I think it's actually quite exaggerated that the reality of that problem in this country, I don't think that's much of a problem. I, Not now. I, but I think the government um, is very unsure about how much appetite there actually is for rapid or more rapid change. The notable thing that I agree with others who've said it about the z net zero by 2050 is although it was almost plucked, I, mean, I know it came from the Committee on Climate Change and other people, and it, it was almost plucked from obscurity where it was, it became um, spread very rapidly amongst other governments, political thinkers, because it had that handy simplifying effect yes. of, because um, essentially where you put the net zero thing, there's no scientific right answer to where exactly that needed to go. And also it doesn't explain quite what the net bit is, of course, but um, so in a way, investing lots and lots of time in arguing allowing an ongoing argument to continue wasn't really going to help do anything. It certainly doesn't help getting financial, technical, economic change because it's uncertain. Yes. So as soon as you, you want to get something to happen, you've got to build in some certainties in terms of returns and things. Otherwise, you're not really going to focus people. I remember when I worked for Greenpeace in the 90s, I think it was Peter Melchett who came back to our office and he'd had lunch with, uh, I think it was people from... It was either BP or Shell or, or breakfast. And he said, well, one of the things, he said, we're, we're on climate change. We're waiting for the signal. And uh, I said, what signal? They said, oh, the fiscal, the tax signal. Because if the government is serious about this, then what they're going to do is they're going to fix the tax system so the rate of return on investment is better on renewables than on fossil fuels. Then we'll start our long-term planning and investing. It's going to be a big thing then. We'll shift everything over, you know. And but the signal never came. Yes. And I think they were like ships that passed in the night because the politicians thought there was a technological process, which means that renewables without them doing anything would start to replace fossil fuels. The oil companies thought the government would, if they wanted something to happen, because they thought the government could make anything it liked happen because that's their experience, because everything was uh, that they did was affected by tax. You know, most of the value of buying petrol was taxation. Um, that the government would just use a tax system 
to do this like it would, had done everything else. And so they didn't, neither of them did anything. And the thing went on and on. And then share price thinking kicked back in the quarterly results with the oil companies. Yeah. And they went back to doing all the things they said they, in the 90s they were going to abandon, like shale gas, you know, and only now has it gone round again. Interesting. Chris, we're out of time. I know that uh, that's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you for sharing some of your insights on all of that. And thanks Thank for your time. Thank you.